morning, everybody, and thank you for coming in such big numbers on the last day. So I'm, I'm glad that you're all, all here. And I want to talk about meetup programming and how it evolved over the time and how it is today. So started with some history, how it all began, and then I will talk about calculations at compile time. And after this, how to deal with types, with something, some words about type traits, how you can dispatch functions at compile time. And then I will say something about optimization, how you can use the compile time features to, to tune your code. And last but not least, that will be a little bit theoretical, um, to show that whatever you can compute, theoretically, you can compute with const expressions. You can also compute it with uh, classical metaprogramming, but then you're limited to integers, and the programming is much more painful. <laughs> but in principle, it's, it's possible. How practical it is is another story. So, so the first meter program, or the first uh, f calculation at compile time was in uh, Bavaria in Germany by Erwin Unruh. It's the most famous program that doesn't compile. So it has a bug in it, but the bug is not the interesting feature. What as a constructor missing? That's not, that's not interesting. What's interesting are the error messages. So depends on what compiler you use. Unfortunately, the newer compiler doesn't show you the, the nice um, history of the instantiation, and um, you don't see the effect pretty well um, with the new compiler. So you see the error map better, but not what I want to show here. So I used GCC 4.5. And especially if you, if you um, filter for certain lines, then we will get prime numbers. So, there are certain lines in the error messages that only contain prime numbers. So and then people realized, hey, the compiler can compute. So I can, whatever I can compute, I can compute it with a compiler and print my results as error messages, which is not ex particularly useful. But um, there are more useful things you can do. So, so, was, so metaprogramming is kind of discovered by accident. It would have discovered certainly later in one way or another, but so the first real meta program was a bug. I love this program. <laughs> so and so after people realized that compilers can compute, so this caused a, a huge excitement, and people did, oh, we can do all the all fancy stuff, and there were some other guys who wrote an um, an uh, a Lisp interpreter, not a complete Lisp, but large parts of Lisp as C++ templates. So say you could fit your Lisp program into a, um, a template, and then it will, it will uh, evaluate this Lisp program at compile time, just to show they can. And it also uh, evolved new techniques like expression templates uh, from Todd Feldhuisen, and it's the same, it was uh, in parallel discovered by um, David van der Voorde. And so, especially Todd started with new, with new kind of libraries, which he called active libraries, and the most famous one is, you know which one? Plitz++. Plus plus. This was the first expression template library, and from, from Todd Feldhuisen, he also is one of the inventor, creator of the expression templates. And he, uh, pushed it really f f hard at the time. He, he went so far that he uh, even tried to um, even run the compiler in a debugger to see what the compiler is doing. Uh, I never did this. <laughs> but then, the, sometime later, people are writing uh, huge ambition uh, libraries, and they pushed it too far. And there was one project in Los Alamos where they had uh, for small programs of several, 70 lines or something, compile times of a week or more with a parallel machine. And 
at some po point, uh, they dropped the project, people run away, and I believe until today, you cannot say template when you go to Los Alamos. Um, and another beautiful record. Um, so yesterday, somebody, uh, to the keynote speaker said that he had an error message of, of 32 kilobytes. This is nothing with templates. <laughs> so, <laughs> I knew people who managed to get an error message of 18 megabytes. And unfortunately, this project was, as they, they dropped this project at some point because it was not compilable, not realistically. <laughs> and so I was uh, afraid of this. I heard all these horror stories before I started with my libraries. And I said, oh, I hope it will remain compilable. And until today, it's compilable in, in reasonable time. And there are also libraries that take several hours to compile, but they do really heavy stuff at compile time. So, and they are willing to pay the price. But usually, if you use metaprogramming, it's not that bad, as people always say. OK, so brings me to the question, what can we compute, what should we compute, and what must we compute at compile time? So but whenever we know the arguments at compile time, there isn't a way to, to compute this. In C++, so the arguments has to be integers. But it's theoretically not a limitation because you can emulate rational numbers and floating point numbers with, with integers. But yeah, it will take a while to get these programs running. And so in C++ uh, 03 or 98, it, it would really con uh, uh, think about if I should write programs at compile time because it, it was kind of, it was difficult and um, Today it's much easier in C++11 and more so in C++14. So writing uh, compile time programs is pretty easy today compared to previous times. And as soon as we have a behavior that depends on type and we, we are writing expression on types, we must uh, use meta programming. Uh, we cannot do this at runtime. So if you have decisions that depend on your types, you must uh, make your decisions at compile time. OK. So computing at compile time. So I start out with classical template metaprogramming. So Fibonacci numbers uh, you have, which computes a sequence. So the first numbers are 1. So the first, first number is 1, second number is it's also one, and then you have the sum of the preceding ones. So it's emulation of um, internally replicating rabbits. So they, they live forever, and after a year, they are able to replicate, and they do so. And then you got more and more and more, and uh, Fibonacci wrote, uh, created this sequence. By the way, Fibonacci is also the guy who uh, introduced the so school math mathematics, uh, as we know, so addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division of uh, numbers larger than 10 with multiple digits. So he um, saw it in the Arabic and Persian world and wrote a, a, a book in Italy. And this is where our today mathematics comes from. So this is probably a, more of a contribution from him, but it's not that so known. OK. so. This is, this is still okay, writing programs like this. But, so we started with this prime number test to say, uh, or we program using, calculating prime numbers. And now I want to do this uh, in a better way. So the original algorithm, which you have seen, it just divided by all numbers up to n minus one, odd and even, and so on. And if you want to do it a little bit more efficiently, we can say, we can uh, filter out some numbers. So first, we can say so one is is, a pri is not a prime number. Two is only an uh, even prime number. And then for all larger numbers than two, we say we divide it by, by the odd numbers up to um, about the square root of n. If we reach the square root or square root plus n, we don't need to test them anymore. And so this is a quite simple program. And I was once implementing this at compile time for good reasons. I wanted to do something with concepts at the time in 2006. So we had the first concept compiler who could handle semantic concepts opposed to the 
pro, um, to the co light concept slides that we will have in some standard in the future. So this, this early uh, concept proposal could deal with semantic concepts, and I was doing something where I need to, to know if a number is prime at compile time, and I want to write a concept that says this number is prime. So and I needed a, a meta program to do this calculation, and it looks like this. Um, yeah, so, so the main function is uh, check it for all odd numbers, or potentially odd numbers, and I explicitly in, uh, specialize this for one and two, and then the check for odd numbers, um, it also looks if the number is, is even, and if so, then, um, then it's immediately a, an, an, a prime number. If not, I have to divide it by all the odd numbers up to the square root. Yeah, doing the same with C++14 and with const expressions looks much nicer. So, so doing this uh, meta program, if you, if you implement meta programs like the previous one, so after this, either you feel you can take over the world or you have the impression, I won't do this never again. <laughs> so for me, it was somewhere in between. I was pretty proud to have it running and but I realized it's not what I want to do for my life. <laughs> not every day. Every now and then it's okay, but not the whole time. Yeah, and in C++ 14, so we have this const expressions, we can, uh, that, where we can write it almost like a regular function. So, so the main restriction is you can only call functions that are also const expression functions. And so to summarize, so Compared to, um, to the template meter programming, so we have a much simpler syntax, it's much more natural. Uh, instead of recursion, so, it's, so the recursion we can end by, by a condition instead of having a specialization, which makes it much easier. We can use floating point numbers in, in, in const expressions that is not allowed in, in, in template meter programs. And certain user types, so it depends on what you have in your type. If you, uh, if you have pointers in it or arrays, it, it doesn't work. But if you have just certain numbers in it and your constructors are also const expression, you can use it. You can use your, your user types uh, in const expressions. And it, it's, it's hybrid. So a const expression, you write, you write such a const expression, and if you call it with a compile time argument, it's evaluated at compile time. If you call it with a runtime argument, it's evaluated at runtime. I will show this in the next slide. And in C++14, there are void functions allowed, which wasn't uh, allowed in, in C++11. In C++11, we couldn't have variables, so, which is allowed now in C++14, but they have to be instantiated but they cannot be static or thread local or so on. There are certain limitations on it. And we can also have, as, as you have seen in the previous slide, control structures like if or for loops. Uh, go to is not allowed, which is good, <laughs> in my opinion. ASM and try blocks are not allowed. You can throw exceptions, but you cannot catch them. Um, so, and a simple example for another C14. Uh, no, this is all even C++11. So in a const expression, you can also have uh, template types, something you could also do kind of in with meta programs. And you can see this is a simple function to square a number. And we used an, a double here. And it's evaluated at compile time. And there's also a const expression for, for, for variables. And the meaning is different. Slightly. So a const expression for a, vari for a function means compu computed at compile time if you know all the argument at compile time. Const expression for a variable means it must be known at compile time. If it's not known at compile time, it's a bug. The compiler will immediately terminate the compilation. And to show that you also can use a runtime argument, I use the first argument from the, fun from the program call, which is definitely not known at compile time. And it's 
I can I can run this. I can use a can can square this uh, value. So if you have any question at some point, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Yeah. So the question more why is the compiler shouldn't uh, do this on its own? To some extent, to some extent it, it does. If you use, for instance, uh, if you write a, a const variable name, const type variable name, and then expression, for some expression it evaluates at compile time, and you get it uh, already as a literal. So to some extent it does. But it's a good question. I, don't know. Function or what prevent, or the, maybe just in another way, what, why shouldn't I put const expert on all of my functions? You shouldn't. I, I didn't say so. No, you didn't say so, but I'm asking why shouldn't I do it? Because then anything that the compiler is doing compiled by it, it But it won't compile if it's not saying you're just calling a bunch of const const expert. You won't be able to put that on all your functions. No, but it'll do it on our side. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. yeah, so if you have a function that is not a const expression function and you um, you use your result as a template argument, then it won't, won't compile. So this const expression is guaranteed. It's, uh, so it's guaranteed that for compile time argument, it's compiled at, it's evaluated at compile time. Another question? That's an excellent comment. Yeah, so, so the reason why um, we can only call const expert is it's because a const expert function can be evaluated at, at compile time and at runtime. And so the function that we call must also must be evaluatable at compile time and at runtime. So uh, that's why this limitation comes from. There was another question or remark? Yeah. Um, in, thus, in certain compilers, uh, there is a square root implementation that I also wrote my own, which is a quite simple uh, implementation. By, uh, so you take an, the value of i, which you want the square root from, and you have your guess r, and then you take the average of r and i divided by r. And it converges surprisingly fast. And, yeah, or meta program, even. I think I continue. So there are questions at the end again. So, so const expressions in, in uh, C++ 11. So they are a little bit more limited, but theoretically everything you can do in C++ 14 you can do in C++ 11. You just have to replace all your variables by recalculation. Whatever you store in a variable, you have to recalculate over and over again. If you have an if or on switch, you, you use a the question mark colon uh, operator, which is not precisely the same. So there are subtle differences. Uh, if you have types that are convertible to another, if you have mixed types, but in most cases you can, f can work this out. And if you have a loop, you have to replace it by a recursion. And if I do so for this uh, prime number test, I have to admit it's a simplified version. I can, I can do something with const expression uh, from C++ 11. Um, here I did it up to, to the number of, of i, not to the square root, to avoid the second, uh, to avoid not yet another indirection. So the main 
theorem of surfer developed in every programming problem can be solved by adding another layer of indirection. And this goes along those lines. <laughs> but the, um, the message is, if you have C++14 available, use it. <laughs> it makes your life easier. Something else I realized when I uh, prepared this talk, that um, I have in this ugly uh, uh, expression template version, I have here, I have a condition I say, well, it's uh, either it's divisible by this number, and then I'm fine, or I have to continue to check. So if you have a ternary operation, and you have two, um, Evaluate two expressions in it, they are both instantiated, even if only one is used. So they are both instantiated, and even uh, if you have some condition that it, it stops at some point, it will, it will also uh, evaluate all the, all the other expressions. It's probably uh, resolvable by, uh, by yet another layer of uh, <laughs> indirection that you have another specialization on it, but yeah, I think it's annoying enough, this example. So in C++11, we can do this the same if we uh, spend enough time on it. Okay, next topic, uh, dealing with types. This is, um, C++11 introduced type traits, which are mostly coming from Boost. So the type traits in Boost are around since decades. And Many of them are went to C++11 and even more so in C++14. And some of the type traits are really tricky. They have really black magic in it, in its implementation, but many of them are quite simple. They are just done by specialization. So for instance, if you want to, to test if a type is const, which is useful in many cases, you just write a, a general, uh, template class to say the type is, is not const, and then you specialize it for a const type. So the new const expression, a uh, new type traits usually use const expression here uh, instead of const, but doesn't make a difference in, in practice. So if it's static and const, it's, it's evaluated at compile time. And if you use static const expression, it's the same. So, but it's, it's cleaner if you're using, uh, using a const expression. I should have changed this. Um, okay, another thing is uh, we can also write our, our own uh, type traits. So a lot of technical type traits, if something is, a, is const or reference or R value reference already exist, but it also makes sense to have your domain specific type traits. So I, I was writing the matrix template library and have lots of such type traits where I just look for type behavior. And then we can say, well, something is, is not a matrix unless explicitly I know it. And so I specialize this for all the matrices I know. And often cases such template libraries spend a lot of code on, 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 on such type traits. Of course, the type traits cannot use um, derivation. They cannot say, uh, this type is for, is, for instance, a matrix, and all types that are derived from this are also matrices. It's, it's pattern matching. It only applies to the type here. Again, you can solve this by adding another layer of uh, indirection. Uh, but essentially, you have to write it for every type. Unfortunately, in the standard libraries, it's already done. And there's also new uh, implementation to use tricky implementations with decal types uh, to have some functions and they use decal type and then they have the, the benefit of um, having access to um, argument dependent lookup and to um, der derivation, but not going into this here. And then we can uh, functions that work only on certain types. For instance, they have a function that, is, that I only want to apply for a matrix and then I can add a static assert at the beginning, check for my domain-specific uh, property and invite an error message, which is much better than having the compiler done some error message later because the code doesn't compile. And static assert were also available in Boost since long time. So now 
if you have C++ 11 compiler, they will print out the expression that, that fails. But before in C++ uh, 98, the static assert gave you error message that int is not convertible into a, untie, into a zombie type or something like this. And you wonder, what the hell is going on here? And in this case, just look at the line that, that causes this problem. Uh, so the error message was completely nonsense. And so it's, it's nice that we, we can write our own error messages. Unfortunately, it must be a string literal. We cannot compose the string, the error message. So it would be nice if you can say, yeah, I have this type and this type, and, and for this reason, I have problems. So, it's a so the error message cannot be um, composed. I, I hope that in C++ 17, there will be reflections and that we have some benefit for this, but reflections didn't make it into 17, C++ 17. Uh, yeah, another nice uh, example. Um, I, sh I should have shown you the, the wrong version when I just, so I wrote this minimum function as a nice application of the variadic. And if you use, for instance, just the first type as return type, then you get complete nonsense for certain values. And in C++ 11, we have this common type. So to, to, to give it, a set of types, and you get back the, uh, the common type. It's the same if you say um, uh, in plus double plus float, so you get back a double. And it's the same type you get from common type. So if you have an int, a float, and a double, you get double back as, as, a, as a common type. And in C++ 11, it was common type without the underscore team, and then you have to write type name before and colon colon type afterwards to get the type out of this type trait. And in C++14, we have common type underscore T, which is a template alias that picks out the type of it. And so we can write nice um, variadic functions. Another new feature, uh, yeah, you probably have seen this, is conditional. It's the same as a MPL if. So we have a condition and if the condition is true, you have one type, and if the condition is false, then you have another type. So the condition must be evaluated, evaluable at compile time. And yeah, some of you have, might have seen it yesterday in the uh, last talk about variadics, enable if. It's a, yeah, it's a side, side product of, of a library. It's the same, they produce this 18 megabyte error message. This is something good came out of this project to so enable if, so they realize this, that it exploits a sfinar. Substitution failure is not an error. So the idea of sfinar is if you have a lot of overloads with templates and, it's some, and some of the overload um, cannot be substituted. So you, you call a, a template function, you call a function and there's a template uh, implementation and during the substitution of the arguments and of the return types, something, some error happens the compiler will not stop at this point. It will say, okay, I ignore this one, and I go to the next one. And as long as you have, in the end, a unique a function that matches, then you're fine. And all the functions that fail to be a, at the substitution of the, of the arguments, they are igno just ignored. So if it fails in the substitution in the function body, then it's a bug. It's an error. But if it's in the in the uh, substitution of the fu function arguments and of the return type, the compiler will just ignore this overload. And the idea of enable if is to say, I have um, a type that is only there under certain conditions. And so I can write something like the previous one, this matrix operation to say enable if, if it's a matrix, otherwise this function is not there. It's another way to do um, overloading, to say I, am, I filter out only, so I, I have uh, some, some compile time conditions and I filter out by these compile time conditions. It's not as good as concepts. Concepts uh, have um, a hierarchy or have an, a partial ordering. This is more special condition than this condition. With this enable if technique, it's either on or off. And if, and if in the end you have more than one function that are, that where the condition holds, then you have an ambiguity. The compiler will complain about this. 
But the idea here is to say, um, I have this function, and I check this condition if t is a matrix, and if so, the return type is t, otherwise I have no return type. And if I have no return type, this overload is just ignored. Unfortunately, I have another uh, function overload that applies to, to my argument. So I can, for instance, uh, one norm for, vec for exists for matrices and for vector, and I can have an implementation for, for vector and for matrix. There are other techniques to do so with function dispatching that you call function that uh, gives this um, condition as an last, as an additional argument to a helper function, and you can dispatch like this. So there are different ways to do so. But enable F is one of this. Not as good as concepts, but it's helpful in many ways. Yeah, this was the example I, I have shown. Yeah, for instance, one thing that uh, annoyed me since long time is that, did anybody of you uh, program with complex numbers? <laughs> no? Ah. So if you have a complex of double and multiply it with two, what, what happens? The com if you just write two times a complex number, which is a complex of double, um, I don't want to torture you. <laughs> Sorry. So if you write two times um, some uh, complex um, compiler will probably say there is no uh, function overload for int times complex of double. You can multiply a complex double with another complex of double or with a double, but not with the int, which I found annoying. And so at one point uh, between Christmas and New Year, I, I added this function in two or three hours by this, this uh, enable if technique. So because I wanted to, so I added into the standard namespace, don't tell anybody. And <laughs> so I could multiply any of a com uh, complex number with any non-complex number or with any other complex number, even if they're different value types. And I had to add this implementation for this mixed types, but this implementation should, or should not uh, go into the way of the existing implementations. So I only want to edit if the, t the value types are different. And I had a pretty large, uh, yeah, a, a multi-line <laughs> expression to, to figure this out, what is in double, uh, what is in complex, what is not complex, if the value types are different. And only in this case, I added this operators with enable if. And then I could multiply any uh, real number with a complex num with any complex number. And I need this uh, enable if technique. Okay, something else. Uh, anybody, so I know a few of you went to the um, talk from Klaus Eagleberg about plays. Anybody of you? So he talked a lot about uh, expression templates and, and what, you, what performance you gain. So if you write, for instance, a vector addition. You see I have a lot of matrix and vector examples, but I'm not going too deep into linear algebra. So it's an, the nice way is to have a plus operator. To say, I take two vectors, I add them together, and give, them, give the result back. And then I have to assign it to another, then I usually assign it to another vector. So the problem is that I create a new variable. And I have to, so in the old compilers, it was copied out. So new compilers are more clever. They have return value optimization, they move semantics, and so on. But in any case, we create a new variable. And we assign it to another variable, and then we have a second loop. So we have a loop for, the, uh, for creating this value for the sum, and we have another loop to make the assignment. And a more efficient way is to add a new function that gets references to all the vectors and does this in one loop. So we have only one loop and we have not created temporary variables. But the problem with this is uh, we need different implementations for, for all expressions we have. If you want to add three vectors, we need another implementation. If you want to scale with one vector with a, with a number, we need yet another implementation and so on and so on. So in does this blast libraries, they did this, so they have said, we looked at all the important algorithms and in all the important applications, and we figured out that this also important operations, period. So you have an, sex B, an x, a times x plus y, 
for instance. So he multiplies the first vector with a scalar and the last and add, that, add another vector. If you don't have a an, an scalar to, to multiply, you just multiply it with ones. Usually if you do a test at the beginning, so is the is, is scalar one, then I just ignore it. Uh, then they call it different implementation. And for small um, vectors, it usually very uh, expensive because they have all the tests at the beginning to, to figure out all the special cases and, and have the implementations for the special cases. Anyway, so the idea is you have a fixed set of operations and they are tuned excessively with an filigree register choreography, in, usually in assembler. And if you can use such a function, you in most cases, it's the fastest that you get available. So the idea is, if the only tool is a, ha a hammer, then everything, uh, ev everything looks like a nail. So you have to, to massage your application uh, up until every operation looks like this, predefined. But it's not really nice. In C++, you can do better. And since a long time, and this brings us to expression templates, which um, keeps the uh, syntax and tries to get the performance of this uh, direct implementation. And the idea is, uh, again, adding another layer of indirection. If we, um, if we add two vectors, we don't do it immediately. We return an, an object called, for instance, vector sum that keeps references of the two uh, of the two vectors. So, so we don't add it now, just we, we have an object that has two references. And then uh, we uh, overload our assignment operator to say, whenever I have such a vector sum, I am assign an, an, an element of my target vector is an element of this expression. And so we have the, uh, the bracket operator for this vector sum, and it, it computes the sum of these two entries. So, we, so it, it just inlines the addition at this, at this place here. So we have one loop that does the assignment, but in the assignment, we compute the addition in place at this point. It's a pretty tricky te technique, but the idea is quite simple. And of course, it's now a special case. Uh, you, if you have more expressions, you, you have to templatize it and uh, do not say just it's, it's a vector. To having two vectors uh, of type T, you can mix the types and you can have uh, vector expressions and so on. But the idea is the same. The, co the code gets a little bit more complex, but the, the, um, the principal idea is if you have an uh, operation, don't do it immediately. Just keep references to your arguments and do this operation once you have all, all the arguments that you need for the, for the complete operation, not for, for a single one. Uh, and I heard this comment before. Do we really need this? We have move semantics. Uh, it won't be copied. Anyway, so do we still need this expression templates? Yes, we do. Um, so it's true that in C++11, we have a move semantics that's a, the, that uh, types like vectors don't copy out the results. Um, they can move it. And in most cases, you have return value optimization where the result, where the result um, is immediately constructed. Uh, so if you have an, a new vector and you say the new vector is x plus y, this um, operator x plus y can construct the data directly into the new vector call set, for instance. And you don't see the copy construct, you don't see a move constructor called. It's return value optimization. This works pretty well. So if you have return value optimization, well, then you don't need it. But in most cases, you have it an iteratively. You have an, you have an iteration, and in this iteration, you have, say, x is y plus z. And then you have an assignment. This is uh, usually replaced by, done by a move operation. 
So you don't really copy this result, but you create a new vector. Um, and especially for small data, this is uh, extremely expensive. Memory allocation costs a lot of time, and deallocation also. And you fragmentate your, your memory, so, which can blow up your memory. So we had uh, applications that, uh, that failed because of memory fragmentation. We, we had no memory leak, but it looks like. <laughs> so if we continuously allocate new memory and small memory and then give it f and release it, then it can fragmentate your memory. And then it's, uh, it's the same as a memory leak. So memory uh, allocation is extremely expen is expensive, and especially on GPUs. I had uh, measured uh, GPU um, applications, and people told me, yeah, the interface between the CPU and the... Um, and the GPU is so slow, and if you copy the data back and forth, it takes so much time. It wasn't the problem. The problem was that I had temporary variables, and the allocation and deallocation took so much time. It took 90% of the whole uh, runtime. And so I had to, to remodel the, the whole stuff so that I get rid of these temporary variables. And people told me, yeah, you have to write your own memory management in, in a GPU. Are you kidding me? Do I really have to do this? Yeah, you have to. <laughs> And the other thing is, if you, get a, if you create a new vector, it's, it's called memory. It's not in cache, it's maybe not, uh, you get TLB misses. So the next operation you run on these uh, vectors are much slower than they, they would be if you reuse the old vector. So relying on move semantics is, a, uh, move semantics is a big progress compared to uh, copying data. But it's not as good as uh, having this the expression templates or this ugly loop. They are still better. Depends of uh, if it's worse on your particular application, you have to see. So um, you have to, before, before you start this optimization, you, you can profile it and see if it's good enough, if it's makes it would make a difference in the whole uh, uh, runtime or not. Uh, yeah, something else I'm, I was playing with a lot is tuning, I said, yeah, so it, giving the fact that the template system is Turing complete, so everything that's computable is computable at runtime, at compile time. I can also say I have a, a certain expression which I write, and I can transform it in any other expression by template tricks. And the idea was that I say, okay, I have such a loop, uh, I have such uh, an operation, uh, a loop, and I want to, um, to unroll it because it is faster to having less loop control, having multiple operations in parallel, and usually if you have a compile time size, the compiler will figure it out and do so. I'm fine in time, thank you. And so first uh, strategy, hope for the compiler. Second strategy is uh, to, to unroll it explicitly, but what I wanted to do is to, um, to have this unroll um, size adaptively. So that I can say, I want to unroll it four times on this machine, four, eight times on this machine, or maybe four times for this expression and eight times for this expression. So I wanted to have this uh, in a way that I can, can choose how much is un this is up unrolled. And I can do so with, uh, with templates by having the size as a template argument and just call uh, another function, this is inline, and then you have the functions one under, so you have an, a sequence of function calls. And I, I source this often in publications and in, in examples for fixed time sizes, but many case, many cases you have a runtime size. But you still want to uh, do the unrolling, and like this, I have a um, certain expression, u is three times three plus w, and I want to unroll it in this way. And I can do so with, uh, with expression templates. I have this, this is template meta programming to say, um, unroll it from, from one to four, and it will, if it's one or two, it calls another function, and if it's you know, from, zero to, from zero to three, it calls another function, and then 
um, itself, and when it's four and four, then it has no operations. So I can decide it, I can decide in the call how much I want to unroll it. And did anybody heard of you of the Atlas project? So it's it's also a linear algebra project for for this BLAST libraries, which I say they did all the operations that they declared for to be the most important. And usually they are tuned for a certain uh, platform, like the MKL, the mass, mass kernel library, but is tuned by Intel for, for the Intel processors. And this project, they want to have it portable, and they said, we, we generate different codes, and then we run it on different, um, uh, run each code on the machine, and then look which is the fastest, and, and remember the po parameters. And so they generated tons of code, and they are really long and, and, and ugly. And then they picked the best one. They said, where in C++ we have a Turing complete template system, so I can do this at compile time. So they say, I don't have to general, have to need an, I don't need an external code generator that generates C++ code for me, and then tunes this. I can do this myself. I can say, uh, create this code for this parameters, and it worked fine. Uh, what's that? Yeah, so it's, we can do the same with expression templates to have some, just by doing more templating. And then, yeah, we have an oper so we have a functor that is, has a compile time argument, and I also introduced this notation to say, um, I annotate the, the target of the uh, computation with this parameter, and then this operation here is, is unrolled. The sad thing about the story is, at the time I did this, I, I was faster than the compiler, but modern compilers are better doing this. Uh, for, in any case, for um, one-dimensional loops, so modern compilers are better. Uh, so, and even worse, so if, you do, if I do my own um, tricky template stuff, can com uh, impede the compiler for doing his tricks. So I, I knew this from all the compilers. They first undid all the optimizations that the users did, and then they did their own optimization. <laughs> and usually this works with pattern matching. If you find a, match, a, a pattern like this, so, so they, you will hear here that Fortran compilers are extremely fast. So And the people will write an, a three-nested loop for dense matrix multiplication and say, look, look how fast the compiler is. But the compiler ch must just did uh, pattern matching that I know this three nested loops and I replace it with a tuned assembler code. If you do some, uh, some modification, don't just start with one or zero, but with another way, have a triangle matrix, not a, a square matrix, it doesn't work anymore. And the, the Fortran compiler is not faster than C or C. So they have, many compilers have specially tuned op operations. And people will tell you, oh, this compiler is so fast, and they show you these examples. But if you deviate from these standard examples, it's a different story. So, but for this uh, simple loop, usually the compiler, modern compiler does this pretty well. And, but there are other operations I realized that I was faster, at least by the time I tested it. Uh, so reduction operations to have to reduce n numbers to a single ones like a dot product. Uh, a nested unrolling, if you have a loop inside the loop, you can do, apply the same technique. Of course, the code wouldn't fit on a, on a slide. Um, and the, um, the wrap up at the end is kind of nasty because you have all the special cases if it don't fit exactly the multiple of your unrolling. And, and also something cute I did is a fusion of operations. So in many algorithms you have an matrix vector product and then a scalar product, a dot product afterwards, and they use the same parameters. And I'm, I mixed up these two operations with a very special syntax, and the effect was that the dot product already had all the data in, 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 in registers, and I didn't need to, to, to load them, and it was for free, almost. So it's, um, the time for the mat uh, so the time for the fused operation was a little bit more than the vector matrix vector pro product alone. So the dot product was almost for free. And so, but it's pretty dangerous. I have seen uh, 
two days ago, I have seen slides when the Matrix product in MTL really uh, blew up because I did all the tricks and, and Clunk couldn't handle it. And if you don't had Clunk, uh, if you don't had do the tricks, the compiler could do his optimization. And yeah, so I just impeded the compiler for, optim for optimization. Okay. So now comes the, the heavy part at the end. Um, computability of template uh, meta programs. So I say it's that everything you can compute at, in, in theory, you can compute with, the, with uh, at compile time. So Todd showed this um, in 2003 for template meta programming. And he, he built a, a Turing machine with templates. It was a three page long paper and it was never published in a big conference or in a scientific journal. It's, it's still a tech report, but many people cited it. And so do I, often cases. I want to do something simpler, which is easier. So I want to, to show that, um, that const expressions are Turing complete by um, showing that we can uh, model mu, mu recursive functions. And I use the same notation as uh, Lutz Hamel in his lecture. He nicely describes uh, the mu recursive functions. And they are known to be Turing complete. And so if we can say we can implement uh, the mu recursive function, we know that we are Turing complete, which is much easier than, showing it, than building a Turing machine. So, so for having mu recursive function, you need um, first you need a zero function that gets k arguments and returns a zero. Yeah, that's it's trivial. You also need a projection that you have k arguments and we return one of them. That's also trivial. Um, we need a successor function. Again, extremely simple. And we need a, a composition. But to say if you have a function uh, h1, h2, h3, and so on, which each take k arguments, um, and I um, feed in the result of these functions into a function g. So this is something we can also do. It's not, di not difficult. What else do we need? We need a primitive recursion, uh, which returns, for the, if the last argument is zero, it returns a function g. And if the last argument is is one or larger, then returns this expression. So we can implement this as well. And because he, he used um, the successor here on the left side, um, I um, used k minus one here, because I have, I cannot write k plus one uh, for the for the parameters. So I, I've used k as a parameter and k minus one in, in the function calls. So far we have only, um, only total functions. So for, for every parameter we, we, uh, we put in, they all terminate. But with, with total functions, you cannot uh, compute everything. So you need also some, some partial functions that, that gives the result only for certain arguments. And this you get by, um, by minimalization. So minimalization is to have an, a predicate P with k, uh, with k plus one arguments and you want to find uh, for a certain tuple of, of n, the value of z that is the smallest that the predicate holds. In other words, so we have to take this predicate uh, and we, we look for the minimum of z. And this is also something we can easily implement with const expression. And here we have a partial function. So if we don't get a result, we have an internal uh, infinite recursion at compile time. Not good, but <laughs> if we have a value that we can compute, then we are fine. Um, so for instance, if you want to compute the square root of seven as integer, we are screwed. The, compile, the code won't be compiled. But if you compile it for, for nine, it will be fine. And so what I did here to, to have this minimization operation is, what did I do? So at first I, I wrote um, a predicate to say i and j. So the j is like the set here in this. 
that, retu that returns true or false. And, and then I, yeah, I did it with a, with a loop uh, in C++11, and C++11 coins expression. C++14 would be a little bit simpler. So to start the loop, I, um, I feed the zero in, and if the predicate holds for a certain value of J, then this is our result. Otherwise, we have to try the next one. And we do so until we find a value, or the compiler tells us, you have too many recursions. <laughs> Please uh, increase the number of recursions allowed, but it won't <laughs> help in, 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 any, in all cases. Yeah, and so what we have shown is that const expressions implement mu recursive functions. So whatever you can write with a mu recursive function, you can write with a const expression function. And in this lecture, which I mentioned earlier, the guy showed that with the lambda calculus, you can implement a Turing machine. With a Turing machine, you can implement a mu recursive function. And with a mu recursive function, you can implement a lambda calculus. And it closes the circle. And all three um, uh, paradigms are, or all three calculuses are equivalent. And what we have shown is that Kohn's expression implements a mu recursion, and by transitiv transitivity, also a lambda calculus and also a Turing machine. So whatever you can implement with a Turing machine, you can implement with a, with a const expression. So that proves that our const expressions are Turing complete. Um, presuming. So whatever you can compute at compile time, uh, at, at all, you can compute at compile time when you know all the arguments at compile time. How difficult it is, it depends on which C++ standards you are on. Uh, so unfortunately, you cannot use const expressions all everywhere. So if you have types as parameters, like in type traits, we cannot use const expressions. And what also didn't work is, what I did in this optimization, if you have mixed compile time and, and runtime arguments, so you had, so it's, the unrolling factor was a compile time argument, and the vectors were one time arguments. And const expression, if you have only one argument that is not known at compile time, it's all evaluated at, at, at one time. And then the tuning wouldn't be a tuning, it would be a, a slowdown. So expression templates and this tuning are still beneficial, not as much as, it, as they used to be, but they are still faster as uh, relying on uh, move ex uh, and move semantics. And so um, that's my talk, and I thank you. And who wants to know more uh, will find the book downstairs. <laughs> and there are nice ladies uh, in it, and I assigned them all they had here. And so you, you can read more about uh, metaprogramming. They have only the English book, not the Russian book, which is kind of discrimination. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the Russian book you have to uh, order online, but it's cheaper. <laughs> it's, so at the beginning it was 1,000 ruble, now it's about 1,600 ruble, but still cheaper than, <laughs> than the English version. Thank you for your attention, and if you have questions. Okay, that will be answered question half. Not at all. It's it's simple. Yeah, but it's probably simpler to, instead of uh, starting with a meta program implementation to start with a pure algorithm, because uh, const expression uh, implementation looks closer to the algorithmic description. What you also have seen. So, so I would recommend to just look at the algorithm and implement it directly. But you, I guess you have already uh, meta programs uh, with templates, and you want to translate them. Yeah, just replace all the recursion by by iteration. Well, the biggest the biggest problem I ran into was um, what what I assume are you know there's there's has been a few compiler issues in supporting some constructs for especially the constructs for auto combination, 
and translating from the templates from template stuff to context version systems or framework systems. I, everybody healed? So, what should I, so he said that uh, compiler issues. I guess you're talking about Visual, visual C++, huh? So are you talking about Visual C++? Um, no, actually, I'm talking about the uh, GCC 5.2, which we are forced to use. Okay. Well, if it's a combination of uh, cons expression and auto, you can still explicitly write your type, which is annoying, but uh, would solve this problem. And it's still uh, it's, it's portable. So removing an auto doesn't hurt. It's, it's only more implementation effort. But I don't know about this feature, especially. No. Sorry, I cannot. I think it's, yeah. But this is no particular technical problem of this compiler, I guess. It's not a fundamental problem of context expression. No, no I, I have no experience with this. Sorry. Any other question? Then I thank you and can catch my plane. <laughs> <laughs>